Welcome to Latinas from the Block to the Boardroom, where wisdom comes from everywhere. This is a podcast about generational wisdom shared to help build a bridge for future generations and to build stronger communities through education, technology, and health. Welcome to Latinas from the Block to the Boardroom. Hola, amigas. This is Teresa Gonzalez from Latinas from the Block to the Boardroom. Welcome to spring, everyone. This is my favorite time of year. This is when all the darkness and the plants have slept through the winter time and they want to come out and show us their beauty. I love the season. Spring is one of my favorite. And this also reminds me of how we can also renew our skills. You know, a lot of people right now are going through layoffs and transition of jobs and probably family uh, situations. So if you'd like to learn more about how you can upskill or look for jobs or how you can find resources, sign up for our newsletter through latinasb2b.com where you can find some resources that can help you. So let's welcome and jump into spring with my guest, Angela Salazar. Angela is a Chicana and an urban Native American as a member of the Pasqua Yaqui tribe. She was born and raised in Phoenix, Arizona, a former high school dropout who ended up working tirelessly to fix her wrongs and break generational curses. She set forth on a mission to leave the environment of gangs and poverty to ensure she was not going to continue the cycle. A former mentee and job trainee at the Chicanos por la Causa and Phoenix Job Corps, she gained resources and access to obtain a position with a higher education institution in 2003. She is currently the Equity Programs Director for the YWCA Metropolitan Phoenix and Community Affairs Director for the Association of Latino Professionals of America Phoenix, Alpha is the name of that organization. So from her past to current roles, she is an advocate for all things racial and social justice. She continues telling her story so that others know that it doesn't matter where you come from or how humble your past is, everyone has the potential to change or to get started on the path to where you want to be. Her passion is to make connections and empower others to push themselves beyond their barriers. Welcome, Angela, to Latinas from the Block to the Boardroom. So when I first met you online, we had a chat, and I was telling you I was going to Phoenix because I was a vendor there for a conference called Dream Bigger for Andrea Segar. She's an attorney, and she's been in a previous episode here on the podcast. She's Latina. And I said, let's, you know, meet. So we did. And you started telling me your story. And I was just so blown back because I wanted to know more and how you're involved with the community so much. And I want folks to hear your story because you really are from the block and going up into a leadership position in these organizations. And I want people to understand a lot of what that takes in the capacity of just seeing yourself outside of what things could be. And it's funny that the conference is called Dream Bigger. And, you know, this is what you were doing. So can you just tell me a little bit about how you, you even told me, you said you, you used your inner chola to, you know, get to where you <laughs> are. So let's start there. How did you use that inner chola? Yeah, so... Growing up, I was from a neighborhood that was really uh, gang infested. You know, a lot of my friends, even family, uh, were in gangs. And I, I ran with it. You know, it's an exciting life. I always tell people it's addicting. You know, it's a cycle, and I could see how people get stuck in it. But at the same time, it doesn't go anywhere. It's just like it is a cycle. You know, it just keeps going on and on, even through the family. And so, I always tell people, yeah, you know, I used to be this chola, I used to wear dickies, uh-huh. you know, chucks, boots, all that stuff. And there was a point where I was trying to get a job and I couldn't get a job. Now that I reflect back on it, it was because of the way I talked, the way I dressed. 
people saw me in a in a different light than I saw myself. And because I felt like I was smart, I was like, oh, I'm a hard worker. People should hire me. And nobody was hiring me. I didn't really have job skills that I could put on paper. Like, I didn't know how fast I could type, you know, but I knew I could yeah. type. But I could do stuff, but I didn't know how to put it on a, a resume or even look remotely uh, professional. Uh-huh. So, um, but I knew how to do something. I knew it was a, a life that I couldn't get stuck in. Um, I had mentor through a program at Chicanos por la Causa. And uh, she was, she was from her own barrio too. She, she was a, in a gang and she still claims it because it's a neighborhood thing. And she really put it in my head that you, you're on the wrong path. You know, you could either end up in jail or worse, or you could do something about it. And a lot of times I always tell people, we can be in this situation that we hate and we can dwell on it and just really focus and get depressed about it, or you can do something about it. And I I really didn't want to go through that. So I felt like I needed to do something, but I didn't have the tools. I didn't know what to do. Even my mentor, um, she could just kind of motivate me and empower me like through words, but she didn't have all the tools. But I was like, I need to figure this out somehow. But I ended up at Phoenix Job Corps, which they really helped teach me how to type, how to measure how fast I type, showing me all the stuff, how to work a computer, copies, all that stuff in the beginning stages. Um, And then also the networking and the professional development they sent me to Washington, D.C. and San Francisco. And like you talk about experiencing something way out of my element. Here I'm like meeting politicians and people that run a whole state. Uh-huh. And I'm like, how do I talk to these people? But, you know, you have to learn by just being in it. So they said, here, have this conversation and talk about why Job Corps is important and how it's helping you. And that really kind of like, even further ignite the fire in me that I could do something with this and I can reach those levels as well. And luckily through Phoenix Job Corps, they did help me find the the job I was at at the university. And even within that institution, like I could move around and I was helpful. I, I love helping people. So I was like a learning coach and ended up a corporate trainer. I really took to the knowledge really well. But then I found myself stuck because yeah. a lot of what we're taught in our culture is work hard. Right. Don't rock the boat. Keep your head down. Be happy for what you got. You know, and so I did that for a long time and I wasn't telling my story on top of that. So one day it was like, what am I doing for myself? <laughs> I'm stuck in this position and I'm not doing anything not only for myself, but for other people. I was in a position where I was no longer helping others. And so I was trying to still look for promotions or something to keep elevating. It wasn't happening. So then I had to like switch up the technique. And uh, luckily, employee resource groups came around. You talk about LinkedIn coming around at the same time. Started promoting myself, started showing people, hey, This is what I'm participating in, not only in the organization, but outside the organization. I started going to networking events um, and being very specific and intentional with who I was meeting with. It wasn't with just everybody Uh because we can't be experts at everything. And I didn't want to be expert at everything. (laughs) Right. You know, so my focus was on what I knew, which was the Hispanic community and a little bit on the indigenous side, too, as well, which I'm still learning about myself. But it was very focused on that specific area um, and mainly targeting leadership because I knew they had a wealth of knowledge I would love to tap into. And so just tapping into that, asking for their stories, uh, asking for tips and techniques and gaining even more mentors out of it, I think really propelled me and boosted me to the level that I'm at right now. Not saying that I'm I'm done. That I reached the pinnacle because it's really never a pinnacle. You know, we're always evolving and changing. And, and I, I consider myself a lifelong learner. Yeah. So that's kind of how I got my, my current position and where I'm at right now. Yeah. So in that episode where you said you wanted to tap into their wealth of knowledge, what is it specifically that you were hoping to gain when you say 
their knowledge? Like, what is the knowledge that you were seeking that you became hungry for, right? Because the draw, right? Like a moth to a flame, not to be cliche, but it's like, what is it that it was like, oh, I want some of that? Or was it like, I want to understand how to navigate this space? Like, what was it for you? Yeah, it was really truly trying to find out how they got to where they were at. You know, when you see people of color Mm -hmm. in these high level positions, unfortunately, we tend to think, wow, they had to be like ultimate super worker somehow, like just had these great abilities. And so I wanted to know what about them got them to that level. And through my journey, I found out a lot of these people are just like me Uh and you. They come from various backgrounds, some of the most humblest backgrounds. And these leaders are some of the most down-to-earth people you can meet. I'm not saying that's the case for everybody because, you know, there's always those exceptions. But (laughs) when I started talking to them, I was like, wow, like, that's amazing that their stories and, and... But the one thing that resonated with most people's stories is the grit or, you know, people say ganas. Like, we do have to work three times harder than everybody else to get where we're at. And and everybody's stories had that same quality to it. They said, you know, I had to work a lot of hours or I had to work all these different positions during my life. Uh, But they felt like they had that talent in them to keep going and the will. And they wanted to do something not only for themselves, but for their ancestors, because a lot of these people, like I said, had the same kind of cycle as me. Their first time in the corporate world, first to graduate in college, first in a lot of areas. Mm -hmm. So it just really inspired me listening to these stories. Yeah. And so now you're one of these stories to someone out there, which is amazing. And you said, okay, I'm just going to try to get promoted and do my work. That was 20 years there and talk about that and making this jump now to your director of the YWCA DEI group. Because when you talk about leaving the hood, you're leaving that situation. It's like breaking the cycle, but it was 20 years for you. I want to touch on that because a lot of people right now have been laid off, probably in jobs that they've had for a long time and you decided to leave, can you share with us like that feeling, that that moment, that like w- what it was? Yeah, so that's the part I forgot to mention too. When I, when I left my old neighborhood, I literally left every single person, family included. I was like, I'm out, you know, I need to cut ties off because I felt like the environment, the world that I was in was just toxic and it wasn't doing anything for me. You know, uh, I mentioned before, like, family can be stuck in a cycle and they only know what they know. Unfortunately, they might have the great intentions of loving you because, yes, they raise you. But at the same time, again, they only know what they know. So that's why I made the choice to cut everybody out because I felt like I needed to throw my whole self into a new environment and meet new people. And so, you know, it was scary just going out on my own, but... I always tell people risk versus reward. Uh When I pulled myself out, I didn't say it was gone forever. I needed to be pulled out of that environment. And yes, I reconnected with some people. Yes, I mended some relationships after the fact. But going back to being stuck in my position and then thinking, you know what? I need to do this all over again. Like I need to throw myself into a whole nother environment. I always thought, you know, at that time, too, I thought risk versus a reward. How long is it going to take for me to get a position at this level at where I'm at? Being there 20 years, like you think, like it's a, that's a big chunk of your yes. life, you know? So this opportunity came up partly because I was marketing myself online, not saying, hey, I'm looking for a job. Uh-huh. Hey, uh-huh. it was like. This is what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. Because I do want to show people and I wanted to inspire people. That doesn't matter where you're at, how old you are, what your background is. I I tell that story too online. Like, you know, I use slang like, oh, it's a chola <laughs> or like I quote rap lyrics, <laughs> you know, because a lot of people can relate. Right. So like I was 
marketing myself without intentionally saying I'm looking for a mm-hmm. job. So people started noticing and and it, and it, tri- it trips me out to this day because like I go places to, and people uh, like the other day when my boss got me was saying, Angela's at this event. Like, I don't even know you. <laughs> but <laughs> okay. But, uh, things like that will happen. Um, you know, so people noticed what I was doing. They approached me about this position and it was aligned with the passion and purpose that I found through this journey that I'm on. And when you talk about safety, you talk about going from like a corporate setting to a nonprofit. Obviously, money is always going to be a factor. Not that I'm aiming to be uber rich, (laughs) but, you know, I want to provide for my family and make sure that I have a steady income and that I'm not falling backwards, but advancing. Uh And so I had to take that into account. And a lot of us do that because we do want to feel safe and we don't like to gamble on things. Uh You know, we want to make sure that our decisions are going to be very cautious and meticulous. Uh But then again, like like I told you in my inner chill, <laughs> it's risk versus reward. Right. It's like, hey, let's do yeah. this. Yeah. Let's just go do it and, and see what we can gain out of it. If it doesn't work, hey, uh, I always have my talent to fall back on. Like I said, I, I found a purpose and a passion, and I knew if it wasn't going to work with this particular organization, I knew I could land where I need it to be. Right. So you had that inner confidence going forward. And, you know, you bring up something really interesting about risk versus reward and confidence, right? A lot of us don't want to leave a position because we're like, we're good, right? We're, we're safe. And how long do I have to do this? I mean, I was in that mode for a long time myself in tech and don't stir the boat, right? Because we're raised with that mentality, right? Like you said it earlier, we should be thankful. We are thankful. We're grateful. But at the same time, we know our worth. We know we get the job done, like you said. And the gunness, right? It's like we're taking the leap of faith on ourselves. So it's like you're taking, you're more of the investment, right, of yourself than investing in the job. And I always talk about that in business as well, or people wanting to start a new gig. It's like, what is the worth of yourself? And the job you're at right now, because everybody can look right now and say, oh, I got laid off. I read this poor woman's bio. She wrote lamenting from Salesforce. She'd been there for eight years in the HR department. And she was a woman of color. And it was so sad. And I saw everybody saying, how can I help you? And everybody in those comments were white. And I said, you know, that's Mm. some shit, right? I totally wanted to post about that. But I digress here. I'm just saying, if you feel you can make the move, make the move, because right now is a huge opportunity for reskilling, leadership roles, all these things that people want to do, right, Angela? And you were offered a director role from your job of 20 years as a director of the YMCA in a DEI group. Can you talk a little bit about what the program is like? that you'll be doing? Is it working with mostly women or young girls? Or what is it that you're bringing into the position from this last role and your experience from growing up, you know, where you came from? Yeah. So going back to your comments, though, I forgot to mention, it was hard talking about myself. You know, it was hard talking about the wins and the good part. But at the same time, I didn't want to talk about just the negative. Yeah. I always told people at my last organization, Post what you're doing. Post those wins. Don't think that you're showing off. Don't think that you're trying to be conceited. There are going to be people out there that think you're, oh, you're just too good for everybody. No, it's, we don't do that enough for ourselves while everybody else is doing it. So it is like a muscle. You have to keep flexing it and growing it. So this role that I have now is because of what I was doing things outside the norm. Having those uncomfortable conversations. Let's talk about identity. Let's talk about intersectionality. Let's talk about microaggressions or those biases that we grew up with. Because I wasn't shy in letting people know, like, yeah, there's people in my family that say racist remarks. You know, I grew up that way, too. But that was because I only knew one culture and I only saw Mm -hmm. 
majority of one culture. So it's unlearning all of that, knowing that there's a bigger world, there's so much knowledge out there to be had. So in this role, equity programs director is taking all of that, putting it into a program, sharing it with people who need to learn or open up their mind. And in this ever revolving world, movies of, uh, you know, old movies from back in the day that I used to love, like, so, <laughs> you know, sketchy now. Right. Um, <laughs> you know, languages changed. Yep. We're growing to be more mindful of others is what we're really trying to get at. Yes, we are about empowering women as well. But when we talk about social equity, it's looking at society as a whole and how we can just all work together. Yeah, we might not like some things, but doesn't mean I have to push my beliefs onto somebody else and vice versa. There's a way that we can still cope and work and be friends with each other while at the same time being mindful of everybody Mm -hmm. else. That's the main purpose of this position. And like I said, I was doing that in my old organization. And what I was posting was stuff that I was going through on a personal basis. Like, hey, this is some trauma experiences that I've had. You know, people don't talk about it, but I know a lot of people can Mm -hmm. relate. That's why I like sharing my story because... When I'm sharing my story and and that person says, you know what, I I thought I was the only one going through that. Or I thought nobody could relate to that. But here you're telling this story. That gives them the power to share more. And it's like planting a little seed to people. It starts growing and growing and you get people who feel like they belong. They feel like they have a voice that they could be seen and heard. And that's really what it's about is just empowering people to do the same. Right. And I'm so glad you're in that position as a director at the YWCA in their DEI group. And I want to understand, because you're talking a little bit about technology, okay? Now, I always say I'm a Chicanosaurus, right? Because it's like, I don't even want to go back to the days before the internet, okay? I don't even want to tell you what I was typing or (laughs) keyboarding on before everything blew up, okay? I was like, cell phone, when? Okay, I don't want to talk about it. (laughs) You mean you weren't waiting an hour and a half on the yeah. dial-up? <laughs> yeah, you know, you know what I'm talking about, right? It's like I was on Yahoo Mail. I still have my full name on the Yahoo Mail. That's how old school I am. It's like I don't want to go there. <laughs> so, but I just did. So let's talk about technology because that's how it's influencing the younger generation, right? And you talk about sharing your story and also these platforms that we're on, like the podcast. And so when they're listening to your story, Angela, it's like they do feel that people are trying to conceptualize what that means from a street gang level or, you know, what that means in the community. And I think you touched on something very interesting, which is it's a culture. It is a culture. It is a mindset, just like going into technology in, in Silicon Valley, working for Facebook or you get hired at Google or Salesforce. There is a culture, right? And when you leave that culture or you get into it, there is a shift and it's about adaptability. Uh And I want to talk about that because right now people are in a shift mode, especially right now with everything that's going on post-COVID, inflation, the job market. What would you say you know, in this shift mode, I think it's a great time, even though it sounds kind of sucky, but I think it's a great time to explore and kind of, like you said, flex a little. I agree. We are in this great time where people are showcasing their authenticity or finding themselves all over again. Uh, Me especially, because you talk about being in the corporate world. I didn't see anybody that looked like me a lot of times. I couldn't relate to anybody. I couldn't be uh, like, hey, you know, like, what's up? Like, <laughs> right. Good morning, right? Nessa. Like, I couldn't talk like that. Like, use a lot of swing. <laughs> People would be like, looking at me like, what? What did she just say? You know, <laughs> you know, Chola is a culture. You know, we have a certain dress we like. You know, we like tank tops. We like tattoos. I mean, not everybody in the culture spans the range, but we have uh, a love of music, all these, and uh, we love Carmen's. So, like, when I entered the corporate space, I had to put all of that away. Uh I had to assimilate. 
I had to change the way I talk. I had an incident where I was getting a tattoo while a couple a few uh-huh. years back, and the the tattooist he was from my neighborhood, so you know we were talking about a lot of different things. But the when I first came in for the first ses- session, I was wearing a tank top. I already have tattoos on me, but when I came in for my second session, I had came straight from work, so it was I had a, a button up shirt, uh, slacks, you know. And the first thing out of his mouth, he's like, oh, shit, are you a professor? And I was like, what? <laughs> no, this is coming from work. This is the dress code. And so, like, that's, like, people in the neighborhood, that's what they think. You know, if you're dressed up, oh, you got money. Oh, you must have this really good job. I'm like, no, I just leave me paycheck to paycheck at this time, you know? This was a few years back, but it's things like that. And when I do talk to people from the neighborhood or people from my past, I can clearly see the change in myself. Like, obviously, my vocabulary is way different. And I could get the look from them like, oh, snap, she's she's got some intelligence in her. She's eating some big yeah. words. You know, I went to go visit my mentor a while back and we were having this conversation. And, and she's really proud of the, the growth I made. And I remember she was telling people, in my head, I'm like, I really haven't done that much. But, you know, from a neighborhood perspective, it's really a lot, uh-huh. you know, to make it out of the neighborhood, to break those cycles. It really is something special. So I feel like that's something everybody should strive for. It doesn't matter the age. You don't have to be in your teens, your 20s, 30s, 40s. It could happen at any time. If you feel stuck in your position, even to this day, like, there are things you could start doing now as hard as it may feel or may be, there's things you could start doing today. Uh-huh. Looking up on LinkedIn, reading other people's stories, getting that inspiration, going to a uh, speaking engagement, because those can really spark something in you. And a few more instances of that, you'll start taking the wheel on your own journey. Right. And I want to say, especially now, technology has a huge influence on that, Right. You hold so much power in this. I say this all the time. There's so much power in your hand that you don't even know that you're you're not even utilizing to the full capacity, right? You have access to so much data, so many ways that, like I said in the beginning, it's how you start to really internalize the information, right? Education is always key. Where you get the information is really important. There's libraries, people. Those are free. Those things still exist. In fact, those were considered the first internet, if you will, right? You had to go there to get all the information. But again, I want to bring up something about the libraries as well in regards to the internet, is that there were not many people of color being published of books that are in the library. It's still today And it's the same on the internet when we talk about people of color in corporate worlds Uh and technology product teams, what's being promoted out into the internet, right? Yeah. So just from that perspective, how do you feel about technology? And then now the youth and everybody, there's a digital divide. Some people still don't have full internet access, but everybody has a phone. They have access to a phone. So what would you say about that? Right, right. Yeah, so there's really no excuse of obtaining information at this point. The sources can come from anywhere, like you said, local and afar. And I did notice that, you know, small tidbit, I was kicked out of high school in my the beginning of my junior year for the full year. I couldn't get back into school, but because of that, I spent a lot of time at the public library just reading whatever I could. I felt like I didn't want to lose the knowledge that I had obtained that far. And I didn't know if I was going to get back to school. But yeah, you're right. There wasn't that many people of color being published. Even going in the corporate space, looking for mentors or looking for people to look up to, you know, I couldn't find them. But I guess in the back of my mind, I'm thinking I could probably be one of those people to inspire, you know. And I think that's more fuel for everybody that we need to aim for those spaces because then we're going to inspire these children, yep. kids as small as three years old. Mm-hmm. They need to see leaders of color 
and know that these roles are obtainable and they need to see that they could go into sciences, they can go into art, they can go into mathematics, they can go to the moon, they can go to Mars. Right. They need to see people of color. And if we don't strive for those ourselves, then who is it going to be? Right. Exactly. All I got to say, people, hidden figures. You remember that movie where they went to the library yeah. and then they couldn't get access to the books that she knew she had to get, which is TRAN4. People, TRAN4 is the first code in, in computers, FYI. Just, you know, that's how old it is. So, <laughs> <laughs> But you bring up a great point. We've never heard that story before. Uh -huh. It's 2000. When did that movie come out? Like I think it was, a, it, it, was, it was a few years ago. And it was by a woman of color, a black woman, because she found the story, right? To talk about those four women. Uh -huh. And this is where I talk about your story, our stories being more out into the global network. Somebody has to tell the story of how these big things happen and women of color are just pushed down out of the scenario until somebody can open up that box and say, hey, you know, Quest Love did the same thing about the Summer of Soul, right? It happened at the same time Woodstock oh, yeah. happened. Oh, my God. That was like, right. I didn't even know. And my mind was blown. All these beautiful people of color having their own, quote unquote, Woodstock called the Summer of Love in New York City. And it just came out and he won an Academy Award for that. Right. So we're talking about our black brothers and sisters here. We need more Latinx people bringing their stories forward, which is why the NGL Collective and Me Too and all that. They're trying to work with Hollywood more Latinx house right. from, you know, Monica Ramirez. All these folks that I've had on my podcast. It's like these are the stories, right, of how we're influencing on the ground level. And we need to get where we're making an influence on day to day things, even consumer products. We influence the biggest consumer market out of all of them. There's stats in there. And here we are. We're just here. Yeah. And I think the beauty of technology, though, because, you know, I talked about not seeing those leaders. And here we have the Internet, access to the Internet. You know, there's YouTube. There's all these social media platforms. And we have a lot of influencers online, which is amazing that they're all telling their stories. But what I did, too, during the pandemic, especially, is attend these webinars, listen in, take in as much as you can. And then when there's an opportunity, share your story or share your experience. And I think that's really what helped. You know, when I started talking about some of these raw and real experiences that I had, people really resonated with it and Eventually, when I started attending more webinars, they're like, I remember even from the last webinar, because you had told this story. And then uh, eventually, your name starts getting around. And I remember going to the Alpha Conference, which I'm, I'm part of, which is the Association of Latino Professionals. I went to their national conference in Orlando. I remember the first night we got there, me and another board member, friend Sally, I wasn't wearing my glasses and she's like, let's go to the pool. We went to the pool, we walked around a little bit, you know, it was very chill. Nobody said anything to me. And the next day, I remember I put my glasses on and uh, we were going to another event. And as soon as we started walking, people were like, hey, Mary Angela, right? And I was like, yeah, bye. Like, I see you on LinkedIn. <laughs> You're a LinkedIn superstar, right? Building that influence. I'm not I'm not lying. I'm not lying. That's how I found you. <laughs> oh my God. I love this. And last midterm you posted a picture of you walking to the voting booth in your fucking chanclas <laughs> and your socks. And you're just like, I'm doing it. I'm bringing my kid. I don't care. I, you know, I was like, Yes, that is authentic. Well, my Mexican you, candy. You had it remember. all going on, like your most authentic <laughs> self on LinkedIn. You're like, I'm going to the voting booth right now. I don't care how I look. I'm going. I need to go. <laughs> yeah, I think that's the trip out thing that people trip out on me a lot. Is because like I'll go to a gala and I'm wearing 
a dress, a sleeveless dress, and I'm showing my tattoos. I'm the only one showing my tattoos because everybody tends to hide them. Yeah, I'm doing stuff like that, but I'm being myself. Yes. Why hide that? Mm-hmm. I know people look at you a certain way, but those are not the people I really want to consult with mm-hmm. either. You know what I'm saying? Like, let's all be real about it. You know, there's a lot of fake people in, in the professional world. But I, I like reminding people, especially in the professional world, that we have this whole demographic. We have a whole community that we're forgetting about, mm-hmm. but have so much potential and talent. Yes. Yeah, they might not have PhDs. They might not even have an associate's degree. That doesn't mean they don't have talent. You know, so I love reminding people that, especially because my journey is not traditional by far, but it can be done. But, uh, not everybody is cut for college, but that doesn't mean they can aspire or aim uh-huh. high. It still can be done. And so I like to tell people that and like, People laugh because, you know, I always did up on pictures and like, like I said, at these fancy galas, I literally like freaking hundreds of dollars to attend, but I somehow get there for free. But I'm like, I'm not hiding who I am. Right. This is me. Yeah, no, I think it's great. I even love that golf picture when you're like trying to, you were at the golf course. I was like, yes, cholas invade the golf <laughs> course. Yes, I love it. I love that. Can you imagine, though, like my family or friends seeing that picture? They're like, what? She's on the golf course. <laughs> I know. I know. It's so fun, though. And so I'm just going to wrap it up here because um, that last comment you made, right, about authentic self. So we have talent. You're, you're a constant learner. These are things you're still learning about yourself. And this week is like the biggest thing ever, right, in like American money. And that's the Super Bowl in Phoenix. Phoenix hosts a lot of things for professional sports. And so we have this conversation about unlearning things that we have been constantly bombarded with. And one of the things is mascot names. And you said you're just learning about your indigenous identity. So how does this play into your like social thought process right now? In the future, you know, because everything is accessible online. People are waking up to the history. They're talking about it. And it makes people uncomfortable, right? Because you're like, am I participating in something? So I just want to get your perspective on that a little bit. Because the whole Southwest, including California, was Mexico until 1849. And before that, it was Native Americans that all lived here. But Can you share a little bit about how you're feeling about that? Yeah. So talking about history, Phoenix, the first Super Bowl that was trying to get here, they weren't going to have it because we didn't have an MLK day. And the only reason why we started having Super Bowl here is because they voted it in to have the Super Bowl here. So you talk about money. It is all about capitalism. Mm -hmm. They didn't voluntarily. They're just like, hey, we're going to lose out on a lot of money. Let's change it up then. So, yeah, those kind of things, you know, it's America. It's not an excuse. And again, we talk about evolving in society. Things have to change. Things have to evolve. And like I said, when we talk about being more mindful or inclusive of everybody, yeah, we do have to make some changes. Unfortunately, people don't like change. It is uncomfortable. We talk about change. If you're not feeling uncomfortable, then you're not changing. Yep. And then we talk about cultural appropriation. We talk about having these NFL teams, Chiefs and whatnot, Redskins, very vulgar. And a lot of people didn't know the history of that. And so they rolled with it. But once you learn the history, you know the background of it, and you're still rocking with it, what does that say about yourself? And we talk about cultural appropriation when you're doing chants or wearing a headdress and you're not Native American. Like, what is that? Even if you were Native American, is it for a ceremony? Right. You know, you have to show respect for somebody else's culture. Mm -hmm. And it's not in light or any fun. It's you're basically just making fun of somebody else's culture for fun and games. Yeah, that's what I have to say on that right now. And then learning about the culture Uh, It is very important so that I do my own learning and that I don't 
do things inappropriately, that I continue growing my mindfulness about it. It is going to take a while for society to catch up and do their own deep dive and start making those changes. So they did start with some teams. Uh, let's hope that it continues. Yes, let's hope that it does. And I'm glad that you, you shared that perspective because you dove into your Yaqui heritage, correct? Yeah, so I'm a member of the Pascua Yaqui tribe. I have my tias, some cousins out in Tucson. There's another community literally around the block from me in Guadalupe. A lot of people are like, oh, you say some things in Spanish. Well, yeah, they're trilingual, so they speak the Yaqui language. They speak Spanish and English. Unfortunately, the Yaqui language is disappearing slowly and surely. Yeah, but, you know, again, we're talking about the stories, planting seeds. Think about, again, hidden figures, the stories that get hidden. And there's so much of our stories that are hidden, right? So if we can bring them out, oh, yeah. reclaiming our language, you know, getting to understand our ancestral heritage and saying, hey, everybody, just calm down and just take a step back. But again, this is privilege that comes in. And this is people that want to stay safe because it is very unpleasant. Oh, yeah. And I want to thank you, Angela, for sharing your story with me today on Latinas from the Block to the Boardroom. I love your LinkedIn post. I love you being your authentic self. And I know you're just going to create more wonderful connections and continue to just build on everything you've learned and are sharing today. So I just want to thank you for that. Yeah, for sure. Thank you for having me. Uh, again, I love our conversations. You know, every time that we can uh, speak on our past just to help inspire others, I encourage everybody, take that opportunity. Don't be scared that it's bad. Don't be embarrassed. I guarantee you, Whoever you're talking to has a similar story, if not worse. But, you know, let's let's start helping each other. That's the biggest thing that I think we all need to do within our communities is help each other. Like, don't just keep moving forward and think, oh, you know, I'm, I'm done with that life. You know, we still need to bring not only our family, our friends, but people we don't even know, like help where we can. Yep, we sure do. And that's why I say we're building bridges intergenerational bridges, right? So that we can bring those forward from the block and into the next cycle of where their life should be. But they don't have to leave. They can always go back. It's true. In fact, a lot of people- Yeah, I love some tacos. Yeah, go open up some stores, some restaurants, you know, reclaim the community. That's what a lot of people do. Right. If you feel safe about it, you have, you know, the connections, do it. So I'm all about rebuilding the block, seriously. So thank you for joining me today. And how can we find you on LinkedIn? Just by your name or is under uh, Chingona Chola at Phoenix? <laughs> thank you, Angela, for joining me on Latinas from the block to the boardroom. I hope you were all inspired by Angela's story on how we can really turn our lives around and just really get upskilled to learn the basics and also connecting with our network to see how we can really lift up community and how we can move forward in a leadership position where others may not see us represented in our communities. Her story is so empowering and I really wish that we could bring all of us together in some big event in the future so we can hear Angela in person. If you'd like to connect with us or learn more about our resources, you can follow us at Latinas. B2B on Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook. We also have a YouTube channel, so please follow us at Latinas B2B, and you can subscribe to our newsletter at latinasb2b.com. This podcast was produced by Teresa E. Gonzalez of 5E Leadership and Marketing also co-produced and audio engineered by Robert Lopez. Gracias, mi gente.